And good evening, everyone. Welcome to Arcane Radio. I'm Sean, the Fork Chop Forker. Joined tonight, as always, by Lon Strickler. Lon, how you doing? Ah, we're hanging in there. Been a long week, but... I'm into that. Yeah. Yep. Long as well, we're, for we're here tonight, ready to go. Yeah, we are. Interesting show tonight. Robert Sullivan the Fourth going to be talking about cinematic uh, imagery and uh, other things. That's going to be interesting to talk about. I haven't heard from Robert since we were on BTE. Going to be interesting. Yeah, I think we were one of the first shows that had him on, and uh, since then he's been making rounds. He uh, the first book was the uh, about uh, the Book of Enoch and the uh, Solomon's Temple, which was pretty interesting. It was the basically Ark of Enoch. Yeah, the Ark of Enoch it was about basically about the history of the Masons in the United States, and uh, had a lot of neat stuff in it. Uh, he uh, had like a, a follow up to the first book, his last chapter of the uh, of his last book, kind of started talking about uh, cinematic s symbolism uh, and uh, he followed up with it with this book and I think he's writing a second one for this as well so he's into this yeah, he's got quite a pedigree uh, he went to uh, Trinity College Oxford University Widener University School of Law he's a very well educated guy nice guy we've, we've talked to him in the past uh, he's a Freemason right you said uh, high degree 32nd degree. 32nd degree. And it'll be interesting to talk to him a little later. But before we get to Robert, you've got some interesting things to talk about tonight, Juan. Yeah, I was, um, I was going through a few articles that, uh, that my friend Jimmy Bryan from Canada transcribed from some of the radio shows. And I noticed one where he had had a caller that, called into J.C. Johnson's appearance on Coast to Coast last October. And he was talking about these mini T-Rex encounters. This was in West Texas. You know, I've been reporting on the small dinosaur-like cryptids in South Texas for the last few years. In fact, I had published about, I think it was three, um, three posts on that. So this guy... That called him. His name was Dan. Lived in Bakersville, California. Uh, he said, "I want to tell you about something that happened to me when I was about 13 or 14." Uh, so he was living in Midland, Texas, at the time, and we would ride our motorcycles in the desert outside of town. And we encountered—I don't know how to describe it. You guys were talking about a mini T-Rex. Is it from West Texas? Speaking now, he was speaking to host David Schrader and, and JC uh, because we saw. I remember seeing this thing, and it was probably about two foot high. It stood up on its back legs. It didn't have like fingers or like you normally see a T Rex in the movies with three or four fingers. It had. It only had one claw, and now I remember we were running our motorcycles around and scared it off. I guess. It was green, greenish yellow, I think, in color. I never really thought about it. I just assumed it was some weird, you know, lizard. But I remember it was about two, two and a half, maybe two, two and a half feet tall or high when it stood up. Uh, when it stood up, it had an egg-shaped dome. I guess it meant his head. Um, the only thing I can say is that it did look like a T-Rex. It had an egg-shaped face or head. Um, said there was um, four of us. We were about 13, 14 years old at the time. We saw it was crawling along on all fours. And as we rode up on it, it reared back. And it had these little tiny arms. It looked like a little T-Rex. So I honestly thought I missed it or it was standing or it didn't see it right or until years later. Uh when I heard that call on art show, it was angry. It wasn't happy that, that me and my friends were riding our dirt bikes in the area. Well, that was on coast to coast in October 26, 2014. So, um, 
I don't know what to say about that. I mean, I I I, I know down in South Texas from the uh, from the border north up into San Antonio, which is a I don't know what they call it. That's the the southern plains of Texas. I think they call it. The uh, there have been several sightings down there. What people are seeing, I, I, I guess they're I guess they're seeing small lizards. You know. Well, I don't know. Many T Rexes are pretty uh, pretty rare. <laughs> I yeah. can't say I've seen one running around. No, and you know, J C and J C. I talked to J C today, and he told me that from what he understands, some of these get to be, get some pretty good size to them, upper to nine, ten foot. Well, Jesus, that's pretty good size lizard. <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't you know, call I, that mini. No, and I, I know some. Um, I know some sightings had come out of Utah as well at one point. Uh, there was a guy who had an encounter up Montana at once. I remember, and he swore that was a T Rex. So I don't know. You know, I don't know what, what's going on, but it's. Uh, you know, there you go. Well, as long as it stays down there and doesn't start migrating up here, I'm okay with it. <laughs> you know, speaking uh, of Texas, you know they uh, are looking are looking to uh, secede from the union again. Apparently. Oh Christ! You know, I, I think that turns in every time the elections come around. I think that's something they start. So what they're going to uh, do is they can keep their T Rexes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the first time, yeah, the secede from the Union, then Mexico invade them, then they want the United States to help <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> stranger things have happened, and that's why you listen to Arcane Radio. Uh, there, there's another thing I want to talk about. Uh, I don't know how many people have been watching this show. Apparently, it's got a pretty good following. But um, there, there's a show out called Hunting Hitler. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I posted, I posted something the other day, uh, as you know, when I was growing up, you know, I was fascinated with Adolf Hitler and the third Reich. And, you know, I don't know why, but, you know, I, I guess after I read William Shira's the rise and fall of Adolf Hitler. And some, I also, re I wrote, read a couple of other books too. I wonder, you know, I, at that time, I wonder if Hitler had faked his death. And escaped to parts unknown because you know these Nazi hunters have found other members of the SS and party elite. I mean, why would it be such a stretch to believe that you know Hitler didn't get away? You know. Well, apparently, yeah. parts unknown is uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Yeah. Well, it, I think the the areas they're concentrating on are northern Argentina, uh, near the coast, and um, you know who's to say they didn't created an elaborate ruse that you know that he actually continued to live his rest of his days out in secret uh you know in 2009 and i remember this because i wrote about the mystery mystery quest tv series took the challenge of finding clues of, of hitler's death and you know there had been speculation that he escaped south america notably argentina and the witnesses had said that they had seen him around other parts of Germany, regardless of the story, is there is no tangible evidence of a corpse belonging to Adolf Hitler. Now, in the Russian archive, uh, they had the uh, the Devon that he was supposed to be killed himself, one with the bloodstains, and a piece of human skull with a bullet hole in it. So the mystery quest then, at that time, sent an American archaeologist to Russia to obtain the evidence from you know the items. And they brought back to the United States for DNA, DNA testing. Uh, subsequently, back in Germany, a team of experts was reconstructed in the bunker using computer technology, uh, attempting to figure out if the eyewitness accounts were plausible. Now, the underground bunker had large generators that might have been loud enough to drown out a gunshot. What they discovered was the original working generator allowed them to hear the noise in intensity during the whole time Hitler apparently committed suicide. Now, around the same time, three U.S. professors were given access to the alleged remains. <clears throat> Their announcement was there was scientific DNA proof that the skull and bones that 
Russia had claimed since the end of World War II were Hitler's actually belonged to a woman between the age of 20 to 40, and her identity remains unknown. Now, this announcement rekindled the interest in the claim because Stalin said from the very beginning that he didn't believe you know, Hitler died. He believed he got away. And um, the truth is that no one saw Hitler and Eva Braun die in the bunker in Berlin. So, you know, of course, the date that he was supposedly had killed himself was April 30th, 1945. Now, no photographs were taken to document the claim that Hitler and Braun committed suicide. Hitler's body was never recovered. Go no figure, was, right? Because we yeah. wouldn't want proof or anything. No. And no definitive physical evidence exists proving Hitler died in a bunker in Berlin. So there's, the questions left are, is it possible that Hitler escaped Nazi Germany at the end of World War II to plot revenge and to plan the rise of the Fourth Reich? If he did survive, how did he escape and where did he go? So since that time, several investigators have raised the historical possibility that Hitler did escape Nazi Germany at the end of World War II. The FBI, the FBI and CIA records maintained at the National Archive indicate that the U.S. government took seriously reports at the end of World War II that Hitler had escaped to Argentina. And for the past month, the History Channel has presented a series titled Hunting Hitler, which was derived from 70 pages of FBI material that were the classified in 2014. Now, the information in these documents indicate that the Bureau continued to probe the question of whether Adolf Hitler might have actually survived World War II fleeing to Argentina. Now, the, the, the show itself is described as an FBI cold case that has lain dormant for 70 years, leads a group of world-renowned investigators on an the ultimate manhunt to find, finally answer the question, did Adolf Hitler survive World War II? In early 2004, FBI declassified hundreds of confidential documents showing that Hitler may not have committed suicide but escaped to South America after the fall of Germany. A memo from e. J. J. Edgar Hoover himself states, the American Army officials in Germany have not located Hitler's body, nor is there any reliable source that will definitely that will say definitely that Hitler's dead. Now, armed with the most cutting edge technology and these newly released FBI files, the team will approach this case like a modern death claim investigation. Whether they are investigating a mysterious Nazi lair deep in the Argentine jungle or diving for evidence of a missing U-boat that could have shuttled Hitler to South America, our team will focus on and the tried and tested tenants for solving a fraudulent death case. Now, you know, the big question is, could Hitler have fled the ruins of Berlin and lived out his day in South America? Uh, the theory is being taken seriously for the first time after the hunting Hitler team discover, discovery of a secret tunnel beneath the German capital. Now, Tim Kennedy, who's a top U.S. special foreman's opera, operative who had was part of the unit tracking Osama bin Laden after 9-11, and Sasha Kiel, who's a German historian from the Berlin Underworlds Association, made the discovery. And they, they show it on the TV show. The producers and the researchers for the series learned that there was a mass Nazi exodus from Tempelhof Airport on April the 21st. 1945, the day after the last recorded public sighting of Hitler. Now, we've all seen that video, I mean, that, that film where he was, he had walked out the bunker and, and was greeting some uh, young Hitler youth. Uh, I don't know if you remember that or not. I don't know if I recall that one. Yeah, well, uh, on that date, eight planes were apparently loaded with the Fuhrer's personal effects and there's record of this uh the team worked out that the nazi leader could have made it from his bunker to the airport almost entirely underground using the existing subway which was built during the period except for the final 200 yards 
Now, rumors have long circulated of an unknown tunnel connecting the final, final 200 yards from a nearby subway station, once known as U-6 and now called Luffbrook, to the airport. Using a state-of-the-art sonar device, the team located that tunnel. Once inside the now abandoned but well-kept airport, a false wall covering the tunnel efforts was found. This provides the missing link from what was the U-6 subway station to Tepehoff and could have allowed the Fuhrer to escape without being captured above ground by the, the invading not to, excuse me, the invading Soviet army. Now, the team has also collected tantalizing information in Argentina. The evidence includes a sprawling, sophisticated jungle compound, uh, underground Nazi hideouts, uh, proof of monetary and support connections with Nazi sympathizers, and a location where U-boats were observed delivering Third Reich escapees. Now, it's going to be interesting to see the further evidence that's disclosed in the series. I think there's going to be two or three more episodes left. So, you know, we'll see. Well, check your local listings for uh, hunting Hitler. Yeah, it, it, I, I tell you, it's it's very interesting. Um, you know, I, I you know I kind of watched it out of a whim, figuring, nah, you know, it's going to be the same old thing. But they really, uh, they <laughs> they really dug into this thing, and um, I'm kind of impressed with what they've been showing. Yeah, I got to check it out. You know me, I'm a huge fan on World War II documentaries. Did Hitler use body doubles? Sure. I would imagine fact, they, so. They think they, they think it was a body double that was uh, actually killed. Yeah, so it's not impossible to think. In fact, not too long ago, I saw an article on the internet, and you know everything you read on the internet is real. <laughs> but uh, they were showing some photographic, uh, I would call it photographic evidence, pictures of an aged uh, fellow who looked like an aged Adolf Hitler. Yeah. I mean, it looked too eerie, too similar to him for me to discard it as just bunk. But well, know, there is knows. a greedy-looking photo that's been making the rounds. I think it was from the um, from the late fifties, early sixties, where someone claims it was Hitler and a, one of his girlfriends. Uh, it's funny; the girlfriend was uh, was uh, a black woman. Which is kind of interesting. <laughs> I don't know how. I don't know how uh, that went over. With. Go Hitler. So uh, you know, I don't know. It, it's possible. I don't know. So uh, you know, there's been a lot of speculation about this, but you know, the fact that there's been all these all these Nazi war criminals that did escape and. In fact, uh, Eichmann, I mean, they did catch him later, but uh, Joseph Mengele, they never got him, but they did find his, you know, his remains. I just uh, pulled a picture up on the internet uh, yeah. that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And it's just weird. You yeah. just look at that picture, and though it is a little grainy, you look at that picture and you're like, that's Hitler. Uh -huh. It's weird. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. But stranger so, things have happened in this life, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, who's to say they're not going to be able to find out, the, you know, what I, and he may have actually done it. I mean, there, 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 there is circumstantial evidence that he could have very well done it. I mean, it's, it's, it's the most compelling evidence I've seen over all these years. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it just makes you think if. if if some of his, the party elite and SS got away, why wouldn't he be able to? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I, there's a show on uh, Netflix right now called Nazi Hunters. Mm -hmm. You can pull it up. There's like seven episodes on there. It's, you know, exactly what we're talking about right now. And it's just interesting that these guys were able to flee and then live these secondary lives as if nothing ever happened. Yeah, yeah, yep. So, um, but if Hitler did manage to live and and make it to Argentina and 
Man, that's just a shame. You know, no mm -hmm. justice there. Mm -mm. So we'll have to see what happens in the next couple of weeks. See what you know the deal is with this. Um, uh, I guess how would we ever prove it though? Well, I, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, I guess the only way they could really ever prove it is that they somehow had DNA from, and they have, they have relatives from Hitler's. Mm -hmm. uh, his son is actually, uh, his illegitimate son is actually still alive in France. Uh, they could get DNA samples. Uh, I, I guess they're going to have to figure out where there are remains actually yeah that's what so, i mean Where i mean if they, can, if they do that they can go you know i mean that's how they found out about a mangula so <sighs> weird yeah it is weird you know if hitler did have a black girlfriend that's gonna piss off a lot of neo-nazis <laughs> yeah they could prove it yeah <laughs> It's just a joke, folks. I you know, hope nobody takes that too serious. But nonetheless, I mean, it makes a good point. Yeah. Um, Stan, said, Stan Gordon said something to him this week about a couple out in, uh, I don't know, Ligonar Valley, Pennsylvania. I don't know exactly where that's at. I guess that's out his way, out in uh, Westmoreland County. Is that it? Right? Yeah, it's yeah. pretty close to Stan. So, uh, this couple actually observed what they said was a transparent creature on November 23rd, 2015. Uh, this husband and wife are taking a scenic drive through Lagoon Valley. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. Saw something very strange and unexpected on the afternoon of, uh, in this in the afternoon now of November 23rd, 2015, about 2 p.m., and they were traveling on a rural road about two miles from uh, Ligonier. Uh, the driver of the car noticed some movement in some bush on the right side of the road. Suddenly, an animal exited the bushes and began to trot from the right to the left in front of the vehicle. Now, the driver stopped about 10 to 20 foot from the animal to obtain a better look. The couple was startled by what they were seeing. It was no ordinary animal. As they could see the outline shape of the animal, but uh, it was not solid and there were no color of fur observed. The husband, as soon as he saw the creature, thought it was some, somewhat like a fox, but could not be sure since no physical features could be seen. His wife also agreed it was a four-legged creature similar to a fox. <clears throat> the body of the animal was estimated to be about 18 inches to 24 inches long. Had a tail that was about a one half to one quarter in length of the body, and the animal was a lot s smaller than a deer. The husband told me, Stan, that the creature had a smoky veil shape. His wife, however, got a better and longer look at the animal as it entered the road and trotted in front of the car. She told Stan that she could see through it, and there was a specific area within the body shape was like an energy pattern. It was like a smoky heat wave. They uh, they watched as the animal continued to cross the road and entered some brush in the left side of the road and was not seen again. The couple didn't hear any sound or notice any smell during the four to five second observation. Uh, Stan said the general air has a long history reports of UFO sightings of various cryptid encounters. Well, you know, I, I tell you, I, I have had similar reports like this, not necessarily in Pennsylvania, but in other places. And I attribute it to uh, a spirit energy of an animal of some type, or you know, you know, or a human will walk across the road or something, and, and you would kind of see a form. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that. Um, that's what I think they might have seen. What do you think? Man, I don't know. That's just, just so weird. And I know I say this every week, and folks probably get tired of hearing me saying it, but you know, how do you investigate something like that? Well, you can't investigate that. It's so it's hard. 
this is something that's got to be sightseeing, you know, and uh, I don't know. I, 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 that's the only thing I, I could probably, you know, and like I said, I've had these type of sightings before to me and where, you know, people have actually seen forms of humans walking across a road kind of like that, uh, have that, you know, that smoky look to it or a lot of people say it looked like the predator type thing, you know, the, you know how it has that, uh, that, that invisible, yeah, that distortion thing. <clears throat> I hear that a lot when, with a lot of these, uh, uh, energy phenomena or spirit, spirit energy. Uh, I have seen, well, I've only ever seen one myself that had that kind of look to it. Um, and that was a cat. Um, like a mystery cat, or a... no? It was a. It was. It was definitely a ghost of a cat. Okay. And it kind of. When I saw it, and I've seen cat spirits before, uh, but th this had that weird look to it, like you know, like the predator thing. It was like a, you know, she said a heat wave, a smoky heat wave. That's exactly what it looks like. So I think that's probably what they saw. Um, you know, I always have that feeling that, or that thought that when they create these creatures out of movies and they add these effects, they know somewhere along the line somebody saw something like that that gave them that idea. It's like, yeah, well, that'd be cool. Maybe, you know, like heat coming off the uh, street, you know, when you're out driving and it's so hot and humid, you can actually see the heat coming off yeah. the road. Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, I think that's what they saw, and you know, I like I said, I've had other reports similar to that. So, uh -huh. I guess that you know, if you're not expecting it, I guess that would freak you out. There. Yeah. Uh, so, I don't know how you would ever expect something like that. I think that would be more paranormal if you know you just randomly every day saw distorted-looking figures walking out of the woods and yeah. traipsing across in front of your vehicle. It's just uh, odd. Well. Let's go ahead and take a break here and, and get our guest, uh, Robert Sullivan, and uh, he'll be joining us in a couple minutes. Yeah, but for the sake of a clean uh, show that we can broadcast on other, other stations, I'm not going to play a musical interlude this week. Uh, you're just going to have a brief moment of silence, so just prepare yourselves for that. We'll be back in just a couple. Smoke them if you got them. We'll see you in a few moments. And folks, we're back. Arcane Radio. Sean Forker, Lon Strickler, and uh, we gave a little bio of him at the beginning of the show. Our guest tonight, uh, Mr. Robert, Robert Sullivan. Lon, Robert you with Sullivan. me still? Yeah. Uh, hey, Robert. Thanks for joining us, man. Hey, Lon. How you doing? Thanks for having me on uh, Arcane Radio. Uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah, I think we, we had you on the old show. Oh, I don't know how long ago it was, but we were talking about your first book. So you've come and you've come and written another book, kind of a continuation of the first one, and uh, I, you've got a second one coming too, don't you? Yeah, I mean, no, the the part of this book. Yeah, no, the um, the the first I think it was a while ago. Yeah, it was over a year ago. It was the Royal Arch of Enoch, which was my first book, and the the Royal Arch uh, ended uh, talking about sort of Masonic, uh, symbolism, veiled Masonic symbolism in movies. That was the final chapter of the Royal Arch book. Um, right. and this second book or the cinema symbolism book kind of was a continuation was born out of that one, uh, was born out of that final chapter. Um, and as I was writing cinema symbolism, um, there were more movies that I was originally planning on talking about, but, um, it occurred to me that the book would never end. It would go on for on and on forever. I mean, it was just becoming too exhausting. Um, so what I did was, um, I finished Cinema Symbolism, and there were movies that I wanted to talk about, so I'm actually writing Cinema Symbolism 2 um, as we speak. Um, that's coming along rather nicely, I might add. Good. Uh, so what was the criteria uh, that you set forth when you started this book? Yeah, I mean, it was what well, my criteria would be um, is, is when in doubt, throw it out. Um, I only analyzed <laughs> movies that I was president, I was president that this uh, material was president in. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it, it's just what, I mean, they're, they're, it's just the study of watching movies, um, and watching them over and over again. Um, and you know, some movies you'll see these themes turning up, other movies are completely devoid of it. 
Um, and, and, you know, when, when I was doing Royal Arch, um, you know, that, that was more of a Masonic bent that, that I put, 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 put on the, on the films. Um, you know, it was more, it was more Masonic movies, but this, this book deals with really like a lot of Gnostic themes, mythology, numerology, archetypes. Um, and, you know, going into it, I mean, I knew some of it all, all already. I mean, I knew some of the stuff with the Star Wars movies with Joseph Campbell. Um, I had seen the, the Matrix films, which are decidedly Gnostic in, in nature. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it, it was just a, it's just a subject matter that interests me. It fascinates me. And, um, you know, cinema symbolism is available now. And as I said, I'm working on its uh, sequel as we speak. Well, it, it seems that almost every movie has got some type of symbolism to it. I mean, from what I can see, uh, you know, it's it's almost to the point where it gets cliche sometimes. Uh, let's say I uh, just like for an instance. Now, I I like Kurosawa movies. I don't know if you watch have watched Kurosawa's movies uh, like Seventh Samurai and you know some of his early fifties movies. And it, it always it the symbolism is just right in there. Uh, but as far as American movies go, it's give us a for instance uh, of some of what you found as you know being blatant symbolism. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I really you know some of the I mean the the, the books really focus on more like veiled um, symbolism. Um, okay. stuff that kind of just doesn't jump off the screen at you initially. Um, and in fact, in fact, a lot of times, um, you know, it's, it's very esoteric homages to things that you may not, or the viewer may not be, be, be aware of. Um, I mean, some of the stuff that, you know, just, just right off the bat, I mean, like, like, for example, um, like the first exorcist movie, the one with Linda Blair and Max uh -huh. von Cito, um, you have the idea um, in that film of the one Jesuit priest, Father Karras, who's going to be the savior of the little girl. He's going to, he's going to be her. So it's, you know, sort of Christ-like savior. He's going to be the one who cast the demon out and ultimately sat, you know, sacrifices his life for the little girl. So if you pay attention to this, you will see these Jim, Jesus Christ Im imagery ar around, um, Karras throughout the film. Uh -huh. um, one example, for example, you know, for example, he, he is constantly in a state of ascension. Um, generally, he's always moving upwards, up steps, up, up bridges, up roads. He's always moving upwards. Um, and in fact, he's actually introduced, um, and this is, this is very clever on the filmmakers, he's actually introduced, um, when you first see him on, on, on the screen, um, he, he's coming up onto a subway platform. He's rising up on a, a flight of steps, and he's actually coming up, uh, up from 33rd Street, which is a, a clear reference to Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus, of course, was alive 33 years on Earth, earth during his crucifixion. I mean, and then you have the, the, another biblical reference where Karis, you know, he's always in doubt about his Christianity. He's the good little girl's apoth. You know, you know, he's going to be. You know, he's he, it's apotheosis. He's going to become her godlike savior. Uh, but his his doubt about religion permeates the film, and of course he die, he, he gets the demon out, but he dies fly, falling down the flight of steps at the end, which is sort of symbolizing his skepticism about Christianity. If you pay attention to it when he's laying there on the you know dying at the sidewalk, you'll see a word spray painted to the left of him on the wall that says pigs. Um, that is a clear reference to the New Testament tale of Jesus. Um, casting out the the demons from the man into a herd of pigs, <laughs> casting them yeah. off a cliff. So, so the idea is, we know the exorcism is successful, but Karis dies in in, in in doing it. So, so this was really the the, the focus of, of the book was to sort of point out these little, um, the very veiled imagery going on, mythological themes, archetypes, numerology, astrology that the whole kitchen sink is in, um, ancient religions. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, that's cinema symbolism. Well, well, you're going to have me looking at the exorcist in a different way now. Uh, <laughs> oh, the, yeah, the, no, the exorcist is, is, is rife with this stuff. Um, yeah. so it's actually the, yeah, it's, it's the first chapter in the book and, um, you know, it's one of, it's one of my favorite movies, certainly for horror films. And, uh, I had uh, a lot of fun, uh, taking it apart. Hmm. So, um, uh, let's talk about the occult. Uh, now we're talking about, you know, you mentioned the occult. What movies, now, I, first of all, I, I got to say that Stanley Kubrick probably had more veiled references in movies than anybody that I can think of. I mean, look at every movie he's done, starting with like a clockwork orange up into uh, 
the the last movie he did, which was the uh, what was the name of that? Oh. Eyes Wide Shut. Eyes Wide Shut. I mean, come on. I mean, how many? I mean, how did Kubrick come into some of uh, the uh, the references you had in the book? Yeah, I mean, I mean, K- K- Kubrick. Um, Kubrick's movies um, are are very um, loaded with this material. Um, the 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 one that I mean, the, 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 there's a couple of them that really scream off the page. Um, and I talk about The Shining briefly in Cinema Symbolism because uh, uh-huh. there's a lot going there's a lot going on in that film. Um, and you know, it, it, it's it's what I what I like about Kubrick um, is is he 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 uses different. He doesn't use the same technique or the same symbolism twice. Um, he uses symbolism, but he 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 alters it. I mean, he's cognizant of it, so he doesn't want to you know he doesn't want to um, sort of you know repeat himself or, or copycat himself. That's the better word. Right. Um, the, the The Shining is is loaded with um, you know material. I talk about a little bit in Cinema Symbolism. Um, you know, I could have gone on and on. I'm actually dissecting The Shining more in depth in Cinema Symbolism too. Oh, okay. And uh, and uh, no, I, I don't mind talking about it though. Um, and same with Eyes Wide Shut. Um, again, that, that's a, um, that, that's a unique movie. He, he, he uses some techniques in that. Some are more overt than, um, you know, and some are more covert, but no, Kubrick is, um, Kubrick was a fantastic filmmaker. Um, I mean, I like the shining. I like, um, you know, full metal jacket, um, eyes wide shut is a movie that to me, Kubrick really, that's where Kubrick kind of goes all in with. Um, because I, I feel like with that movie, um, it, it's somewhat dull to watch. Um, it, it's not, it's not the most exciting movie, um, to watch. It can become very, you know, boring to, to be honest with you, but, but after watching, I think Kubrick is doing that on purpose. Um, and I, I think that is intentionally done by, by Kubrick. And I think the reason he does that is, um, he wants you, he, he, if you pay attention to that movie and you watch it between the lines, Kubrick is intentionally saying to you, you need to watch this movie symbolically, not literally. Um, and, and he says that he, what, what he's conveying to, to, to the viewer is, if you watch this movie literally, you're going to be bored to tears. And I'm doing that on purpose. Um, and, and the reason I'm doing that is because I want you to watch this movie symbolically. And if you watch it symbolically, you're going to get a lot more out of it than if you just watch it, you know, exoterically. And I think I, I'm absolutely convinced he, he does that on purpose. No, but um, Kubrick's movies, The Shining, has lot, lots going on in it. Um, I mean, that's really just repetition 101. Um, I mean, everything in that in The Shining is, is com- complete repetition, numbers, people saying lines back to each other. Um, something I talked about in Cinema Symbolism, um, and I can get into it if you want, if you want to go into another direction, was the whole notion of the Overlook Hotel being a representation of sort of the dark side of the United States. Um, you know, being sort of the dark side of America, being built on the Indian burial ground. Um, certainly symbolizing the birth of the United States at the expense of the Indian nations, um, you know, before, before they get to the hotel. And, and you'll, you'll see this throughout, throughout the film. Um, Wendy Torrance and Danny Torrance are dressed as the American flags. They're always running around in red, red white, and blue outfits. Um, mm-hmm. Even Ullman, even Ullman, when he's sitting at his desk, is wearing red, white, and blue with the little American flag next to him. So you have this whole notion going on of um, – the, the overlook being this sort of sinister representation of the United States um, going up against the Native American um, nations. You, you'll find that in The Shining. There's a ton more going on in that film, but um, it, it's a great film. And um, again, it's some, something I talk about in Cinema Symbolism, but I get into more in uh, Cinema Symbolism, too. Yeah, it, you know, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. There have been uh, uh, several movies in the last couple of years since Kubrick passed away that I kind of think took the style of Kubrick uh and I'm talking about R- Ronnie Howard in, in fact when he when he did uh, the Da Vinci Code and in Angels and Demons it, it kind of follows the Kubrick style of symbolism and of course the, the Da Vinci Code uh <laughs> talking about symbolism uh there's just so much of it there and uh yeah, but it, I, it seemed like yeah. they had this, it was a connection there somehow yeah, I mean, I mean, I, it's funny you mentioned those two movies, um, Angels and Demons and Da Vinci Code, um, it, it are actually two movies I, 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 I delved into in the Royal Arch of Enoch. Um, okay. Because, because no, I, I don't mind talking about it. Mm-hmm. Um, Angels and Demons, I'm bringing up briefly in cinema symbolism too. Um, but, but it, 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 there's more symbolism in. I mean, I, I, I definitely see parallels with sort of Kubrick style of filmmaking. I mean, the yeah. the 
uh, angels and demons aside, when you get into Da Vinci Code, I mean, of course, you have esoteric themes to begin with, um, you know, just right off the bat. Um, I mean, you have some veiled imagery going on in that, and, you know, it's it's funny if, if you if you have the DVD or Blu-ray of that movie, um, and and you know I, I guess the DVDs and Blu-rays varies. Mine has it. There's an interview with Ron Howard in one of the, one of the making making of sections, and Howard talks about how he put little homages into some of the things going on in the book. Like I mean, I know at one point um, you see a Les Mis poster, and this was referencing Hugo, um, Victor Hugo, who was uh, rumored to be in the Priory of Zion, things like that. Um, but, but then Howard talks about this very um, another level of symbolism going on, and he even says, he says, I'm not even sure what it is. He said, but I know it's in there. Um, and to make a long story incredibly short, um, you will find um, some very veiled Masonic references to this Royal Arch of Enoch degree, specifically the number 13 um, that pops up on the screen time and time again whenever wisdom is needed or knowledge is sought um, or, or wisdom is being revealed. Um, and, and this ties into what's going on in the Royal Arch of Enoch ceremonial. Um, and again, this is something I, I really took apart more in Royal Arch of Enoch. Um, so if you're interested in that, check out the Royal Arch of Enoch book um, for Da Vinci Code. But no, I agree with you. Um, you know, you know, I mean, I, I could definitely see sort of um, Howard's movies especially those two sort of echoing some of the works of Kubrick. Yeah. It, 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 you know, when, when I first watched it, uh, it, it kind of did seem to me like a Kubrick film. I mean, just the way it was presented. Uh, <laughs> and you know, these, it, these symbols that a lot of, a, a lot of these directors will use a lot of veiled symbols. I mean, it's almost it, it, that they don't want you to see it, but that you, you you kind of see it with uh you know you uh i don't know it's that you've by it's veiled enough that you don't consciously see it but you do see it and you react yep. to it i i don't know it's um i don't know I, I i can't think of anything in particular but it's just so much there it's so much eye candy and uh and the da vinci code and like i said kubrick's movies were just like that well, I mean, I can give you some examples for this, and I think I know what you're talking about. Is I think what you're saying is the material's there on the open screen, and you kind of see it, but your subconscious mind picks up, right. picks picks more up on it. Um, and I don't disagree with this. Um, you know, the, the, a, a large section of the book, not a large section, but I, I delve into the philosophies and theories of Carl Gustav Jung, um, the famous psychiatrist, who who talked about this, you know, in his works ad nauseum. I mean, and I, I believe you know, his research is critical to understanding this as to why it's turning up and why it's being used. Um, and I get into that, to, to, I get into that more in, in the book. Um, but, but, you know, just aside, like, I mean, I'll give you some more examples of this and this ties into mm -hmm. like with the exorcist and with Kubrick, um, cause they both use this exact same trick. Um, so for example, we'll, 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 I'll do the exorcist first and I'll tell you how Kubrick used it. If you pay attention to the exorcist, you have the whole notion the whole the whole movie is based around this evil demon, um, it, you know, and th this is really what what is called ne it's what's called Manichaeanism. It's light versus dark, good versus evil, Zoroastrianism. Um, I mean, in Christianity, this is God versus the devil. Same thing, um, and, and you know, you, you get into this whole Manichaeanistic theme of light versus dark, good versus evil. Um, in The Exorcist, you have you know the, the girl living in Georgetown, and this evil force invades not only at the home but in Georgetown in general, takes possession of the little girl. All hell breaks out, out, you know, loose quite literally. And then to get to get the demon out, what do you do? You call in the two sun priests, the Jesuits. You know, what's the symbol of the Jesuits? The sun. So it's the sun casting out the the dark demon. Um, and it's interesting, Kubrick, or excuse me, in the in, in in The Exorcist, Kubrick uses this exact same trick in The Shining. Um, at the beginning of The Exorcist, um, you will see when Chris McNeil, the mother, she's filming a movie within a movie at Georgetown University, um, mm -hmm. and she decides to walk home. Um, you, you will pay, pay attention to this. You, you're, you've seen it a thousand times, uh, but your subconscious mind has picked up on it more than your conscious mind is. She is accosted by a group of trick-or-treaters. What that is triggering in your subconscious mind is, okay, that this is now Halloween. Um, Halloween is the celebration um, of the halfway point between the autumn equinox 
and the winter solstice. This is the death of the sun, the death of light. The darkness is taking over, quite literally, as the days are becoming shorter. Night, a.k.a. evil, darkness is exalted. So what he's saying to your subconscious mind is, okay, darkness is now entering into this Georgetown neighborhood, and it's going to enter this household and take possession of the little girl. It's the death of light, the exaltation of darkness, you know, a la the exaltation of evil. Kubrick does this exact same trick in The Shining, and again, you've seen it a thousand times, you've just never paid attention to it. Mm-hmm. When, when, when Jack Torrance, Jack Nicholson, um, is meeting with Ullman at the very beginning of the movie, when they're having their little meeting, Ullman tells him, he says, the, the hotel's operating, um, it, operating season is from around May, May I, th- I think he gives him the 1st or the 15th, to October 30th, um, and then it closes down. Um, and then, of course, we, we know, you know, f- from watching the movie that the very first day when the Torrance has arrived, that's obviously the next day after the hotel's closing, everyone's shutting down, the, all the guests are gone, the staff is leaving. Um, this is Halloween. Um, right. And it's the, same, it's, it's the same effect. It's darkness is now allowed to roam. Uh, it's the winter months. Evil and darkness exalt, is exalted. So what happens? All the evil demons and ghosts can come out to play in the Overlook Hotel. So th- this is some of the techniques these um, guys use to convey these very esoteric themes to your subconscious mind. You've seen it on screen a thousand times. You've just never, you know, it, it, it's affecting your subconscious mind. Um, and it's conveying these hidden messages to you. Um, and again, this was part of the reason of writing the book was to point this out to the viewer. Um, because when you, when you become aware of this, when you become cognizant of this, you, you will, you know, I think the movies become much more enjoyable. You'll, you'll see different levels and layers going on in these movies, um, you know, that you haven't experienced before. Hmm. Okay. Um, I, I had somebody say something to me a while back, and I, I, I don't know why I just thought of it, but I, you're the person to ask. Uh, why uh, do you notice in a lot of films, even though they're not trying to say it, it's, it, it's nothing to do with the Masons, but you'll see representations of the, the square and the compass. In other words, I, and, and I, I know of one movie somebody was telling me about was the, the, the modern version of Flash Gordon. Uh, oh yeah, where uh, where where Clytus? Yeah, it's all, it's Clytus. Where's the little Masonic square and compasses on right. his chest? Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, th- I in some instances, I think this may be done for theatrics. Um, I mean, it could be. I mean, it, it's interesting that you mentioned Clytus because I actually mentioned this in Cinema Symbolism too. You know, I mean, I mean, in in the in the context of that movie, there would be really no reason. Um, to present that other than maybe to convey the, you know, the whole idea of the Masons being, you know, sort of hidden puppet masters and Clytus being sort of this hidden manipulator of Ming. I mean, I guess you could, could draw, draw a nexus there. Um, but no, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, again, I guess, I guess what I, what I would point out to, to the listeners um, and, and, you know, one of the things that's really critical um you know, you know, when it comes to this research and writing these books, is is the context of the movie um, and what and the context that it's being presented in. Um, that that is really key to this, um, mm-hmm. and it's really key to breaking down these movies. You know, is it a Gnostic movie? Is it alchemical? Um, is it an archetypes? If so, what type? Is it numerology? Is it Masonic? Um, and in some instances, it, it could have. You know, a guy could just be wearing a Masonic ring for. Um, no reason, just for other than other than theatrics, um, you know, or, or or what have you. You watch a TV show like Sleepy Hollow; um, it's very critical, um, and it definitely has some hidden meaning to it. So again, I, I would just say um, it's it's the context of, of the movie. But I I'd, I'd noticed that before with Clytus and Flash Gordon, yeah. um, and the only thing I could I could figure out with it was it's either coincidence um, or just or it's just a, a costume design that's completely innocuous. If you want to get into it, maybe they are trying to convey this idea of uh, Clytus being this hidden hand. Um, certainly, that certainly I, I couldn't really argue that. Um, certainly possible. Hmm. Yeah, because I, you know, I have noticed uh, similar symbols at certain places, but that's the one I do remember. And because uh, uh, I had seen a picture of it not long ago, and I it, it, it reminded me again of it. And uh, I was just wondering what you thought about that. You know. Also, there there is one particular movie talking about Masonic symbols are veiled. I don't know if it's anti-Masonic 
intentional anti-masonic but the movie from hell uh oh yeah uh with johnny depp and where ian holm played uh supposedly jack the ripper uh it was veiled as jack the ripper but he apparently he was the one that was doing the killings and he was a mason and they showed they showed in you know so many references to the masons in that movie i you know i i was kind of shocked in a way that that much was actually shown uh what's your yeah, um, thought on that yeah no i i i i it's funny you mentioned from hell that's a movie that i'm actually taking on in cinema symbolism too there's a lot of veiled imagery going on in that um yeah. the masonic stuff is pretty is pretty on the surface um th- this whole idea um the, the whole idea that the Jack the Ripper killings, I mean, I, I can totally break this down for you. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, the whole idea of the Jack the Ripper killings being a Masonic operation comes from a book um, written by a man named Christopher Knight called Jack the Ripper, The, the Final Solution. Um, and he proposed this theory. Um, I don't buy into it. Um, it, 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 it it's, it's, I, 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 I've researched it 50 ways from Sunday, um, and I, there doesn't seem to be any truth to this whatsoever. The yeah. idea is the idea is that this that the Queen's physician, a man named Sir William Gull, um, who was alleged to be a Freemason. The problem with the theory is there's no evidence to suggest this this guy ever was. Um, this is the Ian Holm character. Um, in in, in the From Hell movie where he is clearly presented as a Freemason. Um, And the whole idea was that 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 there were these pro the, the the prostitutes in Whitechapel were privy to this knowledge that um, the Duke of the Duke of Claremont I think it was had a secret affair and gave and and that that his um, lover gave birth to a Catholic child and this Catholic child would have been aligned for the throne of England which of course can't happen you can't have a Roman Catholic um, sitting on the English throne so Gull was enlisted to murder these women um and he did it in some sort of masonic fashion um but you know and and, and this is you know there, there was this government cover up about it the the chief inspector was a freemason um and th- th- this is the crux of his book and of course this is the crux of the from hell movie there's actually another movie um uh, believe it or not that people know from hell there was a movie that came out in the 1970s i want to say it's in the 70s or maybe early 80s i want to say it's in the mid to late 70s um and it's they 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 took christopher knight's book um and they turned it into a sherlock holmes movie um with christopher Plummer playing sherlock holmes it's called murder by decree um Uh. and it's the same story um it's 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 jack the ripper as a freemason killing these women and there's this giant masonic cover-up um make a long story short the material in From Hell, um, and of course the, the, the From Hell story is based on Alan Moore, um, who is very into the occult, very into Gnosticism, very into mysticism. Um, I don't want to give too much away because this is something I'm talking about in cinema symbolism too, but I, I will say that From Hell um, has a lot going on in it that's beneath the surface, quite literally, um, involving alchemy and uh, what is known as chaos magic. Um, and, and that's yeah. really what, what is, yeah, that's really what's going on in yeah. from hell is, is, is the guy, the Jack the Ripper character is using Masonic ritual as a form of chaos magic to alchemically transmute the 20th century. That's really the hidden theme. One of the hidden themes in, uh, from hell. Great movie, by the way. I like that one. I do too. And I, but, uh, yeah, the, you're right. The, the chaos out, I mean, the chaos magic. I, I, I didn't even think about that. Interesting. Well, somebody in the chat room brought up National Treasure, and that was the next movie on my mind. I mean, you had to have had a field day with that. I am. I had didn't read the book, but you have had to have a field day with that movie, didn't you? Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, National Treasure. My goodness gracious. Um, the the um, this is a movie that I dissected in um, cinema symbolism. In, in excuse me, in the Royal Arch of Enoch book. Um, I dissected both the God, both National Treasure and National Treasure Two. Um, yeah, I mean, my goodness gracious, um, the first National Treasure movie is a Masonic ritual. Um, mm-hmm. You are literally watching a Freemasonic ritual on the screen. Um, it's the Royal Arch of Enoch ceremonial. Um, the Royal Arch of Enoch ritual, which is the basis of my first book, which is the examination of my first book. Make a long story short, um, it's the reco- the ritual. Um, is the is is the um, recovery of this Masonic Knights Templar treasure, quote unquote Templar treasure, um, in the subterranean vault 
um, beneath the holy ground in Jerusalem. Um, and this is exactly what the um, National Treasure movie is. It's yeah. the recovery of this um, hidden treasure vault, this Masonic treasure vault um, in a subterranean vault beneath the holy ground. Um, you know, and it, only it's in New York City, which is a clear reference to the Royal Arch Masons and DeWitt Clinton, um, this very um, famous and powerful early Royal Arch Mason. He was a former mayor of New York, former governor of New York. So, yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're and, and the, the, the second National Treasure movie um, also has has a lot of veiled references. We talked about earlier about how um, Da Vinci Code had this number 13 popping up. Whenever wisdom was required, um, you, you will, you will, and again, this is referencing this royal arch ritual. It's the thirteenth degree in the Scottish Rite. Um, you will find this actually in National Treasure Two at one point when they need information, they need knowledge, they need wisdom. Um, Riley, Riley at one point speaks up and says, "Oh, you know, turn to chapter thirteen of my book. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's where, that, yeah, that that that's where you'll find the answer." So yeah, I mean, a lot of very veiled Masonic. Um, themes and esoterica going on in National Treasure 1 and National Treasure 2. Um, if you're interested in that, um, check out Royal Arch of Enoch. Um, that's why I took on, on, on those two movies. And you, and you know, when you think about National Treasure, I just thought of this when you were talking. Uh, you were talking about the, the, the hidden treasure underground. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, that's kind of a veiled reference to the Oak Island Uh treasure you know where it, it may possibly be the the knights templar that had buried that buried whatever they might have found in in jerusalem uh that's one of the theories but of course they're they're now digging on oak island and uh you know i, I it kind of it kind of gets that theme to me i don't know about you no um no it's funny you mentioned that i think we may have mentioned that in the last show if i if i briefly remember but no i don't mind talking about it if if you get into um if you get into masonic history um and you know you, we talk about this ritual i mean then you start you know you 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 know you know the royal arch was a 700 page book um talking mm -hmm. about how important this ritual is you start to ask yourself um, you know, is this ritual trying to convey some lost lit legitimate history? So you get into the notion of, okay, let's say the Templars went to the Holy Ground, or, you know, you know, they had their base on, on the Temple Mount, that's history. You know, let's say they did find something in a subterranean vault, they right. brought it back to Europe. Um, you know, we, you know, we, we have all of a sudden, you know, whatever it was, maybe material wealth, Kabbalistic wisdom. We have all these Gothic cathedrals start popping up with geometric perfection, perfection, incorporating the golden ratio, astrological alignments, the solstices, the equinoxes, Vesica Pisces. Um, then we have the suppression of the Templars in 1307. They go underground. Okay. Um, and then at some point, you know, they want to conceal this wisdom. So what do they do? They go to Oak Island. Um, and build a subterranean vault to conceal this stuff. Um, it's very <laughs> possible. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't, uh, you know, I mean, and that's what exactly what Oak Island is. It's a subterranean treasure vault. Um, I don't, uh, I mean, I mean, there, there, there could be a nexus there. Um, I, I think that is certainly a rational argument, and I, um, I, I wouldn't scoff at someone who put that forward. I talk about it briefly. Um, you know, you get into the whole notion of, um, you know, I'll just get into this quickly. You get into the whole notion of, um, you know, the Templars going to Scotland with Roslyn Chapel um, being this Templar headquarters. Um, and there's, you know, evidence that this was their sort of their base of operations. You know, maybe from there they went to, um, you know, you know, there to, 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 to Oak Island to conceal this treasure. Um, if you look at the Masonic ritual, and again, this is another nexus to this thing, um, the, the ritual, the Royal Arch ritual revolves around the construction of the second Jewish temple, which is known as the Temple of Zorobabel. Um, and actually, Roslyn chapter, ch Chapel is actually modeled after the Temple of Zorobabel. Um, so again, this is another um, Templar Nexus Royal Arch subterranean vault. So no, I mean, what you propose and what you suggest um, with Oak Island, um, I, I, I would not scoff at, and I, I think is certainly in play. Um, I, 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 I would have no, no problem with that theory. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just thought of it. You know, I, I, I was also thinking about... Um, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of movies I can't that, that they don't have a, a actual reference to Freemasonry, but you know they they kind of they kind of put out that Illuminati thing, which a lot of people do uh, associate with Freemasonry for whatever reason. 
uh, just like Laura Croft, the Tomb Raider, the movie uh, JFK. That's another one. They have all these. I don't know. I mean, they don't really show the Masonic symbols, but they reference like skulls and UFOs and uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, ancient prophecies. Yeah, well, I mean, the Illuminati is certainly part of Freemasonry. Um, I mean, it was a sect of, you know, Masons, um, you know, you know, r- r- really, you know, hell bent on uh, creating, you know, you know, what you would call a new world order. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, they, it has basis in history. It was founded by a guy named Adam Weishaupt. Um, it appears to be, you know, Masonic, it is Masonic in origin. He was a Freemason. Um, there are ties to the Jesuits with this. It, it's funny that, you know, you, you, you mentioned, um, the Illuminati. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with what you're saying as, um, in, in, in cinema symbolism Two, which is the book I'm writing right now. I don't want to give too much away, but I actually have a chapter in this, um, titled the Illuminati in film. Um, and I, I delve into some films that, um, you know, you know, that have illuministic themes in them, but also the Illuminati is actually mentioned. And of course, Lara Croft Tomb Raider is one. Um, and you're absolutely right. And, and, it, and it's funny because um, Weishaupt, if you pay attention to that movie, Weishaupt modeled the Illuminati, I mean, this ties into masonry, around uh, the sun. And if you pay attention to Lara Croft Tomb Raider, um, you know, you know, you, the, the Illuminati is surrounded with a lot of solar references. Mm-hmm. Um, off the top of my head, it escapes me. It's it's funny you mentioned Laura Croft Tomb Raider. Um, pay, pay attention. You know that that movie is based on a video game. Um, and 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 th- th- this is great. Now I, I know this is intentionally done. Um, if you, if you watch that movie again, that movie is it, pl- it looks like a video game. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, it pl- yeah. I mean, quite literally. I mean, you have the the training session at the beginning. Um, you have puzzle rooms that you have to solve. You have boss battles in it. Um, so you know, next time you watch Lara Croft Tomb Raider, pay attention from a video gamer's aspect. It actually looks like a video game. But, um, you know, you get into, like, Illuminist, you know, and another movie is um, Angels and Demons, of course. The Illuminati Mm -hmm. is mentioned in that. Um, Movies that contain, you know, Illuministic themes, another one, I mean, that just screams off the page is um, uh, John Carpenter's They Live, um, you know, with the, 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 the space aliens controlling, you know, everything behind the scenes, you know, as a mind control device, keeping mankind subservient. Um, that's a great one that has very, you know, illuministic uh, themes as well. Uh, of course, Eyes Wide Shut with uh, Stanley Kubrick again, you know, with the secret cabal. Um, and, you know, this, this ties into, again, you know, puppet masters. And, and this ties into, you know, Illuminati, you know, quote unquote, the, the sex magic rituals, you know, which, you know, get, you get into like Aleister Crowley with this, you know, the Kundalini magic, um, you know, at the sex magic temple, you know, with the Illuminati is rumored to be in, involved with. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, the, the Illuminati in film is, is, is a great study. Um, and it's uh, something I'm actually working on right now. This is uh, going to be a whole chapter in uh, cinema symbolism, too. Now, you, were, you when you were talking about Christopher Plummer and the Jack, in the Jack, that was Murder by Decree you were referencing? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I remember that now where they, <clears throat> excuse me, there, there was like an implication of Freemasons in that movie as well. That's right. That's right. That, that movie... Oh. That movie came out in in the late seventies. I want to say that was the first movie that was really sort of modeled after the murder or was it, excuse me murdered after the Christopher Knight book, um, right. which is titled Jack the Ripper: The Final Solution, where where where, where the, the the Ripper killings are spa, are, are sparked as part of a Masonic cover up because the, 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 the prostitutes know too much. I mean, and, and that's where they turn into a Sherlock Holmes movie. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. Christopher Plummer played Sherlock Holmes. It's been a while since that movie, but he, he solves it at the end and then is shut up. The Masons tell him, look, just be quiet or you're going to get in trouble. Um, and this is the same thing that happens at the end of the, of the from hell movie with Johnny Depp. They tell him to shut up or you're, you know, you, you'll, you'll be in trouble. Um, and, and of course, you know, he, he eventually does. And, you know, I don't want to give the movie too much of the movie away, but yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the whole idea, um, of, of the Jack, the Ripper, the Ripper killings being this grand Masonic conspiracy, um, was, was put forth in this book. Um, mm-hmm. and again, I, I'm familiar with it. I, the, the, I don't, I don't buy into it. Um, I mean, it's a neat bedtime story and they're neat yeah. movies, 
But um, but I mean, I don't believe that, that there was ever any sort of Masonic hidden hand behind the Jack the Ripper killings. Now, in, in your book's leading, uh, you, you've made some statements that I need some answers to. First of all, 007, where did the numeral designation come from? Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, this is something I get into in uh, cinema symbolism. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is one of my all time favorite. Uh, you know, I have a whole chapter on the James Bond stuff in cinema symbolism. That's out now. This isn't in cinema symbolism, too. Oh, the James Bond stuff is great. Um, Ian Fleming um, in 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 World War Two was in British British counterintelligence. Um, one of the guys who was under him was none other than Aleister Crowley um, and the 007 sigil. Is that right? Um, zero, yeah, zero zero seven. Crowley Crowley was a double agent in World War One and World War Two, and oh. um, the 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 double oh seven sigil um, of Bond is a reference to an Elizabethan spy master and occultist and astrologer and basically uh, Queen Elizabeth the first personal magician, a guy named Doctor John D. Yeah, yeah, you got it. <laughs> yeah, John, yeah, John D. himself. When 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 D when D was infiltrating the Holy Roman Empire and he would write espionage correspondences to Queen Elizabeth, he signed the correspondence 007 or 007, um, and the symbol the the symbol was supposed to be eyeglasses. Um, it was two circles with a line over it and a line down. It looks like a seven, and and the the implication was that he was her eyes in the field, and the correspondence was for her eyes only. Um, which is where that term comes from. And, 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 you know, you know, D D was involved with the spy ring with Sir Francis Walsingham, people like Giordano Bruno, Edward Kelly, Drake Raleigh, basically to, to protect Queen Elizabeth I from the society of Jesus and, and radical Roman Catholics, for lack of a better word. Um, but no, D was one of her spies and, and Fleming, there's a very, very deep, Hermetic and occult influence on Crowley, on excuse me, on Fleming coming from Crowley, um, and you know, I, I mean, there are examples of this all over the place. I mean, I, I could do a, another two hours on this if we had time, but I mean, I mean, um, the, you know, Fleming wanted to use um, D and Kelly's Enochian magic as an enigma machine against the Germans um, when they when the British captured Rudolf Hess and threw him in the Tower of London. Of course, Hess being Hitler, Hitler's deputy, all the not well, not all, but a lot of the Nazi hierarchy was interested in the occult and astrology. Right. Um, Crowley actually went to Fleming and said, "Listen, um, he said, you know, you know, you got Rudolf Hess. We know he's into the occult. We know he's into astrology." Crowley said, "Listen, let me let me, you know, perform some Ars Goetia demon summoning in front of this guy. You know, we'll scare the living hell out of him, and we'll we'll try to get him to talk about the Nazis." you know, and Hitler's proclivity for the occult, you know, and see if we can't find out some secrets and use it against him. Um, Fleming loved the idea and we actually went to Winston Churchill with it. Um, and the, as the story goes, Churchill vetoed the idea. But um, yeah, I mean, 007 is none other than Dr. John D., uh, uh, oh, Queen man. Elizabeth the I, uh, you know, you know, Enochian magician. Well, yeah, he was an occultist and everything himself. I mean... Uh, that I did uh, that, well, that floored me. I didn't know that where it came from. Uh, oh yeah. Um, you know, and, and if you so look at, cool. I mean, yeah, we won't, we don't have time for it, but if you look at a lot, I mean, Fleming was very influenced by this and just briefly, um, you know, if, if you look at the Bond movies, I have a whole chapter on it. I mean, you will find a lot of hermetic and esoteric symbolism, the unification of the sun and moon, the alchemical wedding, um, al alchemy, or a gold finger who's transmuting the gold in Fort Knox to make it worthless, to make his worth more money. <laughs> we have the dragon, Hugo Drax, the illuminist, um, Ernst Stavro Blofeld, who wants to take over the world. Um, loads going on inside the James Bond movies. Um, John D. aside, um, it's a great study, you know, and again, we just don't have time for it, but check out Cinema Symbolism if you're into James Bond, John D. Um, I got a whole chapter on it. Yeah, I'm going to have to get it now because that's, uh, I'm a, I, I love the Bond movies and uh, it's, yeah, well, that, yeah, I definitely got to get that. So, yeah, you, you, all, you also put some references in here to, um, uh, <laughs> the giant faces that passed judgment on General Zod and his lieutenants back in the, the uh, Superman movie from 78. Uh, what's so symbolic about that? 
Yeah, no, that's um, that's interesting because that's a um, um, you know that's a reference to history. Um, what you are actually witnessing on Krypton there is something that was once a historical fact. Um, you are witnessing the idea of standing before judges without a uh, without a lawyer, without representation, uh -huh. where a prosecutor can present the case and you have no say on it. Um, and, and justice is passed on you uh, immediately, um, is something that is in history. It was called the Star Chamber, um, mm -hmm. and it was a series of judges, and it was part of the English court system, where if you were brought up on a charge, you could face judge and um, jury and execution or without a lawyer. Um, and there was and a movie on Star it, Chamber as well, yeah. Yeah, that the, well, the movie with Michael Douglas was reflecting that. It was a series, it was a group of judges who were passing justice on 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 people who the, the the star chamber movie with michael douglas was was people who had gone to trial but had gotten off on a loophole but they knew they were guilty um so the judges were meeting yeah. in secret to put it yeah. to put an assassin out to kill the guilty person in 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 history the star chamber was created i want to say it was created by the tutors and it was basically a tool of the monarch just basically to go after enemies of the state where they could be arrested, stand before judges, guilty as charged, no lawyer present, no representation, and goodbye. Um, the Star Chamber was naturally put out of business by Oliver Cromwell, um, you know, I want to say in the 1640s. In mm. fact, when the Puritans came to power, um, it was one of the first things Oliver Cromwell did was, um, in the long parliament, was put out of business the Star Chamber. So the, next, the point being, you know, getting back to the Superman movie, the next time you're watching um, Superman with Christopher Reeves and you see that opening scene with General Zod, know that what you're watching was once, uh, it, it was history. You're actually watching history on screen, um, and that once existed here um, in England. Um, and you're watching a cinematic star chamber before your very eyes with General Zod there and the giant faces, um, the judges passing passing sentence on uh, Zod and his cohorts. I don't know how you figure this out. I mean, that that I, that would seem like a reach to me. But, you know, now you, how you described it, you're absolutely right. But <laughs> I mean, what, what, what this was all. Yeah, no, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what when, when, what happened was um, when when I was doing Royal Arch of Enoch, um, the Royal Arch of Enoch book, um, I mean, that was a product of 20 years of history and writing and researching. I was a history major, um, you know. I I, I love studying history, um, and, and 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 Royal Arch of Enoch began back in 1992. Um, the book was published in in 2012. And um, what, what, what I essentially did, Lon, for, for lack of a better word, was I took that 20 years and I turned it on Hollywood. Um, and, and, and like I said at the, at the very beginning of the show, and, I, you know, it, it's very important to me that, you know, I only present material as a, as a lawyer. Um, I only present the information and I dissect the movies that I'm absolutely 100 percent sure the material's in. And I am absolutely, I mean, I, I would have no problem presenting it to a judge or jury. Let's put it like right. that. So I just took this 20 years and turned it on Hollywood and um, out came Cinema Symbolism and, um, and its sequel, Cinema Symbolism 2, which is, uh, again, being, uh, being written uh, as we speak. That's fascinating. It really is. And there's one more here i got to ask you since the, uh, the new movies are coming, the new generation of Star Wars is coming out. Uh, where did the name of Luke Skywalker come from? Oh yeah, well I mean I mean this is a, a, a massive um, undertaking here, but I'll just get into it very quickly. Um, naturally, I, of course, I haven't seen the new Star Wars movie coming out. Right. Um, I mean I'm aware of it, of course. Um, I dissect all six of the earlier Star Wars movies um, in cinema symbolism, both trilogies. Um, basically, um, the 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 what, what, what we what you were dealing with. With the first three Star Wars movies, and of course I'm going in chronological order. This is episodes four, five, and six. Um, you know, A New Hope, Empire, Jedi. Is um, th these movies come out of the world of an American mythologist and symbolist called Joseph Campbell, um, who wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. The Hero with a Thousand Faces is the sun. It's the solar hero, the solar savior, the solar archetype. Um, and this is, of course, what Luke Skywalker is. Um, mm. This is the the young man plucked from nowhere to save the galaxy from the dark evil lord. Um, the name Luke, I mean, his name is the sun. The name Luke comes from the Latin lux, meaning light, and what light walks across the sky, the sun. Um, and, of course, if you want to go into mythology in this, 
um, you know, the, the premier sun god of, you know, of antiquity is Apollo. Um, and who is Apollo's sister? Um, the moon. Um, and of course, who's Luke's sister? Leia, who runs around in the white robes of the moon. If you get into comparative religion, um, you know, Apollo, you know, his, his equivalent in Egypt is Horus, the sun god. And, you know, who does Horus do battle with? This Egyptian god Seth who is the Egyptian Lord of Darkness. So who does Luke Skywalker do battle with? The Sith Lords. Um, so you have a lot of, neo, you know, you have a lot of Neo-Manichaeanism, comparative yeah. religion, solar lore, um, the solar savior. Um, if you want to see this character in other movies, um, the solar hero, the, the, you know, the savior figure, the savior archetype. Um, you know, I mean, obvious examples, Frodo Baggins, the solar savior, the Christ savior of Middle Earth who defeats the dark evil Lord Sauron. Um, if you want to go to uh, a more modern movie, you know, or, or a more, you know, mo mo movie set in the modern world, the matrix films, Neo, the Christ like resurrected savior, who's going to save mankind um, from the dark evil machines. If you, you know, these are more obvious examples. If you want to see more hidden examples of this um, 12 monkeys, um, Terry Gilliam, 12 monkeys, 12 houses of the Zodiac, James Cole, the resurrected savior who comes back to save mankind um, from a deadly virus. James Cole, JC, Jesus Christ, um, you know, who, who helps him, the sacred feminine, you know, the, the psychiatrist Raleigh, you know, the sacred feminine. She's the only one who believes him, just like Mary Magdalene's the only one who believes Jesus. So, yeah, the solar savior, the solar archetype, very popular in film. Some more movies are, are more exoteric than others, but um, Star Wars is a great study, and uh, I do all six movies in Cinema Symbolism, so check it out. Mm. D now, the, the Star Wars, do you, I mean, do you think it was actually written like that? Do you oh, think no that, question. Really? Oh, oh wow. absolutely. I mean, I mean, Lucas has said over and over again um, that, the, that the, the Star Wars movies are based on Joseph Campbell's book. What Campbell talks about I'll get into this briefly. What Campbell talks about in The Hero with a Thousand Faces, it's the solar journey of the solar hero. And what Campbell lays out is certain things happen to this hero um, on this journey. And what, one of the great examples is, um, I mean, you'll find this in all, in, in all these movies that I just talked about. I mean, my God, the character even looks alike, um, is, is what Campbell talks about is one of the things that the solar hero eventually, it, it, he says it happens very early in, earlier in the journey, is he enco encounters the hermit, the wizard figure. Um, and the wizard always, you know, helps the hero along by, you know, the, the wizard possesses the wisdom, but only gives it out piecemeal and helps the hero on his journey. And of course, in Star Wars, you know, in episode four, this is Obi-Wan Kenobi. This is Yoda in episode five. This is, you know, Gandalf the Grey in, in, in Lord of the Rings. Um, this is Albus Dumbledore in Harry Potter. I mean, they all look alike. It's the old Greybeard character. Um, so, yeah, I mean, th this is definitely intentionally done. And I get into some of the symbolisms and, and themes of um, the first three Star Wars movies, Phantom Menace, Clones, and Sith. Um, very, very interesting themes going on in those movies as well. As well. And those are all George Lucas. Um, so, yeah, no, this, this is definitely intentionally done, no question about it. You know, it's almost like it's almost like it was based, and maybe some of these other movies were, to the journey of Jesus. Oh, of course. I mean, it's the sun. It's, it's, I mean, you know, you get into the whole thing with Jesus being the, the sun figure, the sun God, you know, the 12 apostles are the 12 houses of the Zodiac that help the sun God on his annual journey. You have oh. the death and resurrection, right? I mean, you have, come on. I mean, you have, you know, the, I mean, you have the death and you have the death and resurrection of Jesus. I mean, Neo Anderson is killed and resurrected. Um, I mean, you know, you know, I mean, I mean, you, you know, you, you get into, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you, you absolutely find these Jesus solar themes surrounding a lot of characters in, in movies. Um, and of course, if you, you know, this is something I get into more and more Royal Arch is the whole idea of, um, you know, uh, of Jesus being the comparative sun God, you know, with Jesus being the resurrected savior, um, you know, being assisted by the 12 houses of the Zodiac. I mean, we have Christmas coming up. I mean, the birthday of the sun is December 25th. 
you know, three days after the winter solstice, the sun being dead for three days, then being born on the on the 25th. Then, of course, we don't we celebrate its birthday on the 25th. You know, the sun is, you know, you know, resurrected from the tomb of winter when the winter months die after three months at the vernal equinox. This is Easter. The, Jew, the Jewish people call this Passover when the sun passes over the equinox on its way to the uh, Tropic of Cancer corn. This is all uh, so. This is all just one giant solar allegory from start to finish. You'll find these at, find this in movies, and if you're more interested in it from a comparative religion standpoint, check it out in the Royal Arch of Enoch book. I have a hundred page chapter on it because actually, believe it or not, this this whole solar journey is being mirrored in Masonic ritual. And again, this is something I talk about in Royal Arch of Enoch. Well, you sold me. Now nah, I gotta buy the book. I'm sold. Well, let me. Let me just let me just wrap up on this line, um, and I'll just say this real quick. If you're interested in purchasing the books, you can get the paperbacks. Um, but I would just add that as a holiday sale, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Winter Solstice, whatever whatever your flavor is, the e-books of Cinema Symbolism and Royal Arch of Enoch are currently on sale for six ninety nine. Um, they usually sell for ten bucks. They're on sale for six ninety nine. Um, that's the Amazon Kindle, the Barnes and Noble Nook. Um, the i the Apple i bookstore version um, on sale right now. It won't last forever. It's a holiday sale, so if you're you know it's much cheaper than the paperbacks. The e-books of Royal Arch of Enoch and Cinema Symbolism um, are on sale right now as we speak for six ninety nine. But the sale won't for last forever, so jump on that immediately. Well, I'm going to go there at night after the show and buy it. I uh, surely am. I'm looking forward to the well, second one you. now, and I haven't even read the first one. I mean, this is pretty cool. I mean, I, I you know, I didn't really expect all these uh, connections, but you know, it's very interesting. And this thing with Alistair Crawley and uh, and Ian Fleming that just flips me out. I didn't even realize there was a connection there. That is. Oh so yeah, cool. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I mean, you could get into a whole thing. I mean, it's I call I have a whole chapter of it in the book. I mean, you could almost call it the occult world of Ian Fleming, um, you know, when, when you get into this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, he was, you know, I mean, he's hanging around with Aleister Crowley. Um, I mean, just real quick, if you want to see other examples of this, um, <clears throat> another guy who was involved with this spy ring was a man named Dennis Wheatley. Uh -huh. um, and and Wheatley wrote a book, a novel called The Devil Rides Out. Um, and this was made into a movie by Hammer Studios in in the late 1960s. Um, and there's an Aleister Crowley magician in that. Um, it's played. He's played by Charles Gray. It's Mokha um, is is the Aleister Crowley uh, figure in that. So yeah, I mean, I mean Crowley. You know, when it comes to Fleming and Dennis Wheatley, I mean, he he he's he's all over the damn place. Wow. Well, Robert, I gotta thank you again for coming on with us. Uh, this was very interesting. And uh, we'll have to get you to come on when we get the next one written. Yeah, I, in fact, you're writing a couple, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, uh, for starters, let me say uh, thank you, Lon, for having me on Arcane Radio tonight. I'm, it was greatly appreciated. Um, I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, I already went over the sale. If you're interested in more on me and finding the books and, and, and connecting with me on social media, Twitter, uh, just go to my website, www.robertwsullivaniv.com. My name is Robert W. Sullivan IV. So it's www, all lowercase, all connected, Robert W. Sullivan, the letter I, the letter V.com. Um, links there to buy the books, social media, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, I mean, I'm actually writing three books at once right now. Um, I'm doing right? cinema. Well, what I'm doing right now is I started another book of Freemasonry, which is actually coming along pretty well, but that's somewhat on the back burner right now. I'm actually writing the Cinema Symbolism 2 book, and I'm writing my first work of fiction um, also right now. Um, those books are written, being written simultaneously. I alternate between them. Um, and I should have both these books done. I'm, I'm hoping to have them both complete and submitted to the publisher and the editors um, in the next six months, in about six months or so. So I'm probably looking at a release date on both books, um, probably autumn, autumn of 16, hopefully, um, get them out before Christmas of next year. Um, and then, then my plan is once these books are going to go out, I'm going to, I'm going to finish off this next book on Freemasonry. Um, this should be the last book I, I write on Freemasonry. Uh, and this is just going to really fill in a lot of the gaps on Royal Arch, fill in some more of the backstory, but no cinema symbolism two is being written right now. 
um, my first, first work of fiction, it's called a pact with the devil about witchcraft. It's all, all kind of, all kind of good stuff. And now we got conspiracy. Um, th- those two books should be coming out probably late summer, autumn uh, of 16. Um, and then I'm going to go to work on another book on Freemasonry and probably another book on cinema symbolism, cinema symbolism three will probably also get started at some point. Well, we're going to definitely have you come back with us. And, no, it's uh, a great show. I'd love to. All I can say is thanks again, and we'll be catching up with you. you well, thanks, Ron, for having me on our card radio, and uh, it was a great show, and uh, we'll be talking. Okay, take care now. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Great interview, Lon. Fantastic. Uh, cool stuff. Very good. Very I'm good I'm a stuff. Bond freak. I'm telling you, you know, my, my – my Ooh. wife was a Bond nut, and I'm a Bond nut, and my son is as well. And uh, it's uh, that that's just that just blew me away right there. I'm so, just sitting here like, oh my god, there's so much yeah, to this that stuff. I didn't even realize. So so much to this stuff. Yeah, it really is. I got to get the books. I got to read some of this. I'm definitely getting it, and right now yeah. they're on sale for six ninety nine. Yeah, Amazon.com. That's right, on the Kindle. And you can buy Lon's books, too, for the holidays. Yes, buy Lon's books for the holidays as well (laughs) on the Kindle. All right, folks. Well, Shelby pop-up in the archives. Lon, been a good night, and we'll catch you folks around on the next episode of Arcane Radio. Good night, everybody. Mm Mm-hmm.